to start. My name is Jeremy. Uh, I'm with Auth0, which is an identity authentication company. Uh, how many of you here are uh, uh, are currently like full-time developers? Okay, so a couple. How many are kind of hobbyist developers? You enjoy, you know, getting, you know, doing. Okay. Uh, how many of you are like community managers or? Uh, okay, so some of those. How many would classify yourselves as like a developer advocate or a, a developer evangelist or in developer relations or anything along those lines? So a couple of you. Okay. So we are going to talk in this in this talk. We are going to. Oh, ah, there we go. So we're going to talk about developer relations. And as the uh, finger so nicely points up, and I I just had to have. I just had a mental thing to make sure that I used the right finger in the emoji. Didn't realize. So yes, it is the right finger going up. The dev rel is like coffee. So it probably has you all confused right now. You'll hopefully uh, not be confused at the end. So um, <coughs> developer relations. Uh, we'll talk about what it what it means. We'll talk about how what coffee is. We're going to bring it all together at the end into uh, some formations of of how you. Uh, can, you know, in your current jobs and what you're doing actually uh, contribute to developer relations, whether you're a developer, whether you are uh, a uh, in community, or whether you are, you know, just a hobbyist and you're looking to get into the DevRel. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, we'll start with the story. So, uh, back in, uh, so the year's 2008. This is, that would be 11 years from now. Uh, I did graduate from uh, primary school and know that, you know, that's about 11 years. Um, my wife and I at this time have three kids. Obviously, she's the better looking one on the left. Uh, we have three kids, two full time jobs, uh, and we just bought a coffee shop. Uh, nobody said that I was ever the smartest one in the bunch. Uh, but that was us. In 2008, all of those things were going for us. Um, as we bought it, over the next, kind of, next two years, we really kind of embarked on this journey. Uh, we built the shop from being a, a shop that was very exclusive, where you, you walked in and if you didn't know the owner, and if you didn't uh, didn't uh, you know fit within her people group, is, is probably the easiest way of saying it. Uh, you were kind of left on the outside. You weren't. It wasn't very welcoming. Uh, and so when we came in, we you know it took us two years. We rebuilt the entire shop uh, to being very inclusive. Uh, it was very bright, vibrant, it was growing. Prior to that, it had been going downhill. Uh, and we started educating people on what coffee was, uh, started talking about how that uh, you could improve uh, your morning with a good cup of coffee or your afternoon or your evening, depending on you know if you're one of those like me that drinks coffee throughout the day, or if you're ones like you know my wife or others that before you even open your eyes, you have to have an IV infusion of coffee. Uh, understanding how, what coffee was and, and helping to educate people. Um, we also began to uh, you know, build relationships with those that were coming into the shop on a regular basis, uh, and even some of those relationships. So that was so if you do the math. That was that was 2008. Two years later, 2010. Uh, we were building relationships, some that even exist still continue to this day. So nine years later, <coughs> even though we no longer have the shop, I still have relationships with some of the people that were coming into the shop on a regular basis. So uh, for those who just stopped in, we're going to talk about coffee, we're talking about developer relations, how they mix, uh, and what we may be used at this moment, it will all come together hopefully at the end. Otherwise, I'll just leave and take my coffee with me. Um, so, it was also, you know, so as we were building those relationships, uh, it also kind of helped. I started to kind of see um, how developer relations and how building communities started to really mix with some of our experience with having a coffee shop. Uh, so I had spent years as a developer. How many here have ever seen one of those? Okay. It's actually a fair amount. How many have ever actually touched one? Okay, only half of those didn't put their hands up. Um, how many, oh, I, I was going to say, how many know what brand it is, and then it says Atari 800 XL. <laughs> so that's an Atari 800 XL. That was my first uh, foray into computers. Um, that was in 
mid 80s, I'd, I'd have to double check the dates for myself, but it's, it we're saying early to mid 80s is when I got my hands on, on one of these um, through a nice little that just happened to send one. Um, and that launched me on this, this career in technology. So that was you know, many, many years ago um, when I actually had a full head of hair as opposed to a you know, nice bald spot. Um, but before I was 13, I was doing development on, on BASIC. Like that's all you really could do on these, is, is basic programming. Uh, little cartridge that goes on the top, you can play games, or you could, uh, really wasn't much you could do with it in today's standards. But back then, it was amazing what you could you know, do building basic programs. Um, and I was also involved in, uh, in communities. How many of you have ever been on a bulletin board? Or remember what a BBS stands for back in back in the eighties? Okay, uh, that was the online back then. That was how you uh, you know you, uh, you could get games, you could play games, you could talk with people that either were in your city or happened to have called in uh, from you know anywhere in the world. It was an amazing opportunity. Uh, but this was still when they were in their fledgling kind of state. But they were an online community. Uh, I've been a part of them for, for many different years, but it wasn't until, you know, probably in the last 10, 10, 15 years that I really kind of started to connect the dots with what was driving developers uh, and what drives communities and how they how they get together um, and what was this thing that, you know, eventually uh, would be called developer relations. Uh, developer relations itself uh, did not, uh, like the first online example of that word being used Developer relations itself is was February third, two thousand. Uh, Borland. How many of you guys know what uh, know what the company Borland or Borland? Well, I remember that. So again, a few uh, was purchased. I don't know how many years ago, but uh, they were an up and coming tech company for many years. Uh, they actually had a, a department <coughs> of developer relations, um, and even prior to two thousand, had been doing that stuff. Uh, but it was not, you know, that term does not really appear on the internet itself until February 3rd, 2000. Uh, it's, and now we've seen, you know, companies like Google and, and uh, you know, pretty much any company that has, a, has a, a tech product or has something that developers want to use or that they want developers to use, they have some form of developer relations. Um, defining kind of what that is other than that kind of becomes he said, she said. Google has a way that they do it. Amazon has a way that they do it. Um, you know, Red Hat has a way. Like Everybody has a different way of how they do it, and it's all about how it fits into their, um, the construct of their company and how that their, what their product is and how their, um, their processes are and how they need to you know, uh, evangelize or spread the good news around that product. Uh, but, uh, the purposes of kind of what I'm reading here, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, but for purposes of this here, uh, we're going to define developer relations as um, relationships with developers. Uh, it's not really all that flashy. Um, it's definitely not eloquent. So there is another, uh, another way. A good friend of mine, Mary Tengvall, um, some of you may know who she is, she has written a great book on uh, developer relations, what the bu business value of developer relations can be. Uh, and she defines it in a much better way um, of building relationships with the developer community. Uh, and what I really like about this is that opposed to uh, my terrible attempt at a lame joke, it really kind of says, uh, it encompasses so many things about meetups. It's not, uh, sorry, so many things about the different activities you do. It doesn't say that you have to do X, Y, Z in order to build relationships with the community or with developers. Uh, it can be anything from meetups, <coughs> conferences, it can be events, it can be uh, having an open, you know, having office hours where they come in and they you know, meet with some of your engineers, it can be podcasts, it can be anything encompasses building relationships. If you're out there building relationships with developers, you're doing developer relations in some form. Uh, so, uh, back to kind of this coffee shop endeavor. So, 
the person that we bought the coffee shop from, uh, she had, she'd started it five years prior uh, to when we bought it, um, and it had grown, it had been really embedded in that community, uh, but she did it as, you know, she had a she had a daughter that was in high school. She wanted to connect, reconnect with her daughter a little bit more. Uh, daughter was going to be going to a local community college, and so she's like, you know what? I'm going to start a coffee shop. That'll bring me closer to my daughter. Um, fast forward five years, the daughter has now left and gone off to a bigger state college, and other daughters have moved on, and now she's left holding this coffee shop, and as a result, it just went downhill. Um, so she was decreasing motivation and all that. So when she came uh, and kind of uh, came to us and said, you know, I would have been in there, she said, hey, you want it? We jumped on the idea. But um, because she wasn't really devoted to it or wasn't really uh, involved in it anymore, uh, there started to be this, um, she was, how do I say, decreasing motivation. Uh, she took kind of an authoritarian view, kind of she was a mother, and so she decided that anyone that came into the coffee shop was going to be mothered. Um, and whether they wanted to or not, she was going to mother them. How many of you know a mother like that, that says, I'm, it doesn't matter, I'm going to mother you? That was, that was her. Um, so she literally uh, would have the, this whole thing. If you didn't do things in the coffee shop, whether you were an employee, or somebody in the coffee shop. This was the, the view that she had. Shame on you. How dare you do such a thing. Uh, she even had signs that she would put up there. Uh, and when we walked in, it was one of the first things we got rid of. But it was this big sign that said, uh, it was kind of like the uh, Ten Commandments of, of being a good customer, uh, which already everybody's kind of like, ooh. Um, things like you couldn't have outside food or drink, which on the out, you know on the premise sounds okay, um, but uh, if you were in the shop for more than an hour, you had to be able to produce a receipt that you had bought something, or else she would tell you to leave. Um, she would put little. Uh, she said no loitering, which <coughs> loitering is just hanging around. But it's a coffee shop. You're supposed to kind of hang around. Uh, but that was that was the thing that she did. She kept had this authoritarian view, uh, and what she had done is she created this environment uh, where everybody felt like they weren't matching up, uh, that no one felt welcome unless you were part, like I said, of her inner circle, uh, and that all of these different rules, and many of those were unwritten rules too. That she would, if you didn't fit what she wanted to do, she uh, she would, uh, you know, tell you to leave. Uh, see, what it, it ended up happening is that she just was not a good welcoming environment. So, uh, in, there were all sorts of rules, um, and often that there was that steep path that you had to get to become part of the inner circle, and you didn't know how. Uh, which brings me to a principle around successful developer relations. Uh, <coughs> ruthlessly eliminate any barrier that keeps you from building a relationship with your target audience and then with you. Uh, this may require that you uh, revamp your onboarding for your community, whether it's, it's to join up to be part of the community or even to join up to be part of your product. If you have a developer product, uh, you may need to revamp the onboarding. Maybe it's that's keeping them from getting involved, revamping that. Revising the messaging you're using. Uh, make your free tier for a bit, you know, make it a bit more usable, add more features. Uh, instead of it be a free for two, two weeks, maybe it's a free for life. Um, you might need to revamp your website, and hopefully, there's a lot of websites that need to be revamped, but that might be, that might be one thing that's keeping a developer from getting involved, is your website. Uh, or even revamping your target audience. It may be that the people that you're trying to reach out to are not the people that you need to. You might need to do that. But ruthlessly eliminate any of the barriers that keep them from getting, uh, from building a relationship. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to do that. And if you don't, uh, you're going to find yourself uh, going around and around in circles, not really hitting who you want to be. And they're not going to be there. Because if, if they're not using your product, you're kind of lost. So, what does this have to do with coffee? Or what does this have to do with Deborah? 
or this coffee has to do with their product. Good thing you ask. Uh, imagine you walk into your local coffee shop. Um, and to be clear, I, I don't mean like, uh, like Starbucks. Um, I mean like an actual, actual coffee shop. Like what we have that's, that's here, um, who are they? It's the uh, uh, Rebel Bean. That, that would be like an independent kind of locally owned coffee shop, not the Starbucks. And I won't call Starbucks by their real name. Um, we'll get to that. But, uh, so when you say you walk into that a locally owned independent shop, what are some of the things that you experience? Anyone wanna, what sounds, seems unique? Yeah. Friendliness. Friendliness, okay. What do you smell? Coffee. You smell coffee. What, uh, what do you hear? Music. Your music, okay. Anything else? Um, people talking. People talking, yeah. What else do you see? To be comfortable. 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 Yes, comfortable. Often you see people kind of sitting around tables sometimes, um, talking with each other, you mentioned that. Um, <coughs> you see them around tables uh, working, some people are working. I go and sit at a coffee shop and work for hours uh, sometimes. Uh, I, you know, I, and while I'm there I see people that are you know, having conversations. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, you're going to smell freshly ground coffee. That's a, you know, an important piece, uh, as opposed to just you know, stuff that's already been ground and you put in the filter. It's, it's, it's a different type of environment. All of these things, uh, the sound of the machines, you know, the grinders, you have the espresso machine happening, you have the different sounds as they're tapping and, and banging on things. All of those are creating an environment that's familiar to you and to those that, that are there. Uh, but what, uh, what is it that kind of stands out about all of those things? It's the environment. It's the environment that's created within a coffee shop. Uh, it's interacting with multiple senses at the same time. Uh, it's starting to prepare you for what will hopefully be a good cup of coffee, a good experience. All of that is, is part of that environment. Um, and the same thing goes for Deverell. It shouldn't be any different. All of those things should be working together. So, um, obviously, um, the same way you create a positive environment in a coffee shop uh, is also the same way that you would do it with DevRel. Uh, DevRel exists to build relationships with developers, and if you're not doing that, not building those relationships, then you, you as a product aren't going to exist, um, or someone else is going to do it better than you. So if you think about your coffee shop as a DevRel program, um, the baristas is the team, uh, coffee is your product, uh, the espresso machine, the tools of those as, as kind of like the tools that you use, uh, that you offer as your, as your product, um, all of those things uh, kind of work together, or sometimes they don't, and there's a result of that, but all of those things working together uh, can influence the perception of your company perception of your community, perception of your product, uh, positive or negative, and just like a good cup of coffee can make or break uh, a coffee shop, it can make or break uh, your company, or the perceptions of your company, because this, you know, the same perception dictates reality, and it's true. So early in our coffee shop adventure, one of the things that really kind of started to notice uh, is a lot of people would come in and we would have, we used to have this big board, and this isn't the exact one, I'd lost all the, some of my pictures, but we had a big board that had all of the, the menu on it. And it was, it was, uh, it's not as big as the screen, but it, it was a big board. And it had everything you could imagine on there. And when you, they would first walk in, uh, started to hear a phrase, you would first see on their, on their look about as a blank of an expression as you could get, and then, you, then it would go to a confused look of like, and then eventually you would say, hey, what can I get for you? And invariably their comment would be, if they didn't already know what they wanted, their comment would be, um, I'll just have a cup of coffee. And befuddled coffee shop patron, that's a thing. Uh, and that was, that was their statement. It was just, okay, I'm just going to have a cup of coffee. But they had spent time looking, and then they just decided to have a cup of coffee. Um, and after hearing that 
comment a bunch of times, I'll just have. Um, what it started to say to me was it was kind of a, a resignation to the fact that all of this information they were getting, they couldn't process it, didn't know what was. Maybe we were using words that they didn't know what they were. Um, and you know every shop uses a little bit different, so maybe they weren't familiar with it. And it didn't help them understand the menu of how they could choose. And so um, that answer that they would give meant that they weren't engaging with what we were trying to give them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, instead of engaging with the barista, myself, or anyone else that was there, uh, we would just hear them say, I'll just have a cup of coffee. And we didn't have that opportunity to engage with them. So after you know hearing that a number of times, I started to kind of in ask that question, the next question of, okay, what do you normally order? You know, sometimes they were new, and if we hadn't seen them before, uh, we would have that conversation. Uh, you know, oh, well, I go to so-and-so, or I go to Charbucks, and uh, I am used to this. And then we could, you know, say, okay, well, here, that is here. Or here, that doesn't exist because that's a terrible thing, and you should never choose that. We never said that too often. But we... in. Um, invited them into the conversation of what is it that you're looking for, finding out what their needs are in, what their, what their mood was, um, what, are the, uh, what are the things that influence them. Obviously, they wanted a cup of coffee or some wanted a cup of tea and they didn't see tea on the menu, but they wanted something. They just weren't quite sure what it was or they didn't know if we could provide it. And so um, it was during getting those answers that I often got to the bottom of what their um, – their motivations were and what need they were trying to, exp uh, to fill. And then I was able to shape an experience for them that fit to what they wanted. So um, it also gave me an opportunity to educate them on what coffee was, educate them on the process, educate them on you know, why this is better, why uh, blends are not as good as a single origin coffee, uh, why it's better to get, you know, depending on what they're likes and dislikes were around coffee, um, why they could probably enjoy something from South America as opposed to something from Kenya, why dark, like all of the different facets, we could help them understand that once we understood what it was that they were desiring. Um, <clears throat> and that's where my passion for, um, for coffee would really start to come out. See, um, I finally resigned myself to the fact that I was a coffee snob. Um, it, it took a while. Uh, my wife would say, you're a coffee snob. And I would say, no, I'm not. And she would just roll her eyes. And uh, if you spend any time around me, you understand that the rolling eyes is something I usually get. So I, I, she helped me get used to it. <clears throat> um, but I did finally come to the grips that I really enjoyed coffee. I really enjoyed everything that, that it... Um, it's not just something you brew. It's something that you experience. Um, and that first foray into coffee for me and, and what that meant was I was probably about 12. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact age. But I was probably about 12. My dad worked at a car dealership. And I was able to go and make some money at their car dealership by sorting paperwork. Um, it was terrible, but I got paid five bucks an hour to do it, five dollars an hour, uh, and at age 12, that was fantastic. Um, I could spend it on anything I wanted. Uh, but it was cold one day, and I decided I'm going to have some coffee, and I took a sip of it, and it was not, I mean, it probably rivaled Charbucks, uh, but at 12, I didn't really know what that was, uh, and it was terrible. It was sludge. You know, it was, it was thick. It was gross, everything. And so I had to add all of the, you know, I saw what everyone else was doing. They're pouring the milk in, they're pouring the sugar, and they'd start pouring, and they'd look back, and then they'd still pour it. Like, that was what they did, so I did that. And it still didn't taste great, but I felt like, oh, well, that's just what it is. Um, and so, you know, I had to do those things to make it even palatable. But I felt like that's, that's just what it was. Everybody else drinks this horrible crap. Why not me? Um, that didn't last very long because caffeine has never done anything for me, for good or bad. Um, and so it, it was just like, okay, it kept me warm. 
I could go have hot chocolate, you know, as, as opposed. And so I would do that because I didn't have to add anything to it. I just poured it in and that was good. Um, but it wasn't until my early 20s uh, when, um, that I gave coffee another chance via Starbucks uh, because, again, that was the only thing I knew. I didn't know any better. Um, and a friend of mine worked at, worked at Starbucks. And so it, if you don't know why I call it Starbucks, uh, it relates to the fact that they burn their coffee. They literally char the coffee. It's terrible. Um, it's not coffee. It's really charcoal, uh, hence Starbucks. Um, and we'll go a little bit into a little bit more into that here shortly. But um, because of the way they do it, it brings out that bitter taste. Uh, coffee is actually supposed to have flavor, um, not bitterness. It's not supposed to be uh, acidic. It's not supposed to have all of those. It's supposed to be well-rounded with lots of different flavors. Um, and char is not a flavor, um, just so you know. Um, but at the time, it was it's all I knew. And it was a step up from the sludge of my youth. Uh, so I went. And I would go and sit, and I would read. I'd you know, do whatever. My friends would work, and you know, it would be great. And I'd get discounts. That was probably the, the thing. But it was a gateway drug in many ways to, to help me understand there was something more for coffee. Um, and they opened up a whole new world. And so I guess they did have a purpose. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't know if this is being recorded, but you didn't hear me say that, co that Starbucks has a purpose. Um, so, but I did find that I liked an Americano which was, you know, it's, it's espresso with water. I like that, so I just got that. That's what I got all the time. Burned my tongue so many times that I now, you know, have no taste buds here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I figured out, hey, I could live with it. I could live with ordering stuff at Starbucks. It's great. It's fine. Um, then, not long after, um, I couldn't go to, to Starbucks for some reason. I went to a local sh shop not too far from my house, and fell in love with the fact that there was more to cof coffee than what I understood. Um, and that I could find a better cup of coffee. And then I, that started me on this path of looking for, for more. What was coffee, what, you know, I was going to coffee shops all the time. I was trying all different things. I was learning how to make it the right way. I was, you know, figuring out the scientific pieces of if you have this much water, you need to have this much coffee and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and then it, it was also, I all of a sudden realized that coffee actually had flavor. You know, it's supposed to. It's not supposed to be, blah, it's supposed to actually have flavor. Um, and, and I left Starbucks behind. Um, and to this day, I don't think I've been to uh, a Starbucks more than, I could probably count it on two hands, maybe two and a half hands in the last 15 years, how many times I've been to Starbucks. Um, so yes, it's supposed to have flavor. Um, this is an example of the flavor wheel, and it is real. When you read the, the description, so I have a bag of coffee here. Um, it says that uh, the flavor notes are prunes, white pepper, and brown sugar. Um, that's not just you know blowing smoke. That's actually there, and you can find those are in this entire flavor wheel. Um, that's a whole nother talk that probably has nothing really to do with the Deverell, but I could probably make it fit. But there is. Coffee's supposed to have flavor. It's not supposed to be, um, you know, char. It's actually supposed to have flavor. Uh, and that comes from the oils. And so anyways, as I, um, as I got to uh, understand that, I was smitten with the fact that there was so much more depth than what I'd ever imagined, and I could figure things out. And so... Um, I went to coffee shops all over town. Um, I volunteered at shops. I visited a roaster in town that ended up being the, the top roaster in the, um, in the U.S. Um, I, uh, I even competed in a barista competitions, volunteered at a shop to run it, uh, and you know, competed. And if you've never been to a barista competition, that's a whole other level of nerdery that is like un unbelievable. Um, and then, you know, my wife and I volunteered at one. Uh, we took over as managers. It was our church's coffee shop. We ran that for a while. So then when, you know, the manager, uh, the owner of this shop said, hey, we're going to be selling, we jumped at it. Um, 
Again, I probably wasn't the wisest of moves in life as we went back to the whole three kids, uh, two full-time jobs. But hey, otherwise, what would I be talking about now? Um, so what does this have to do with DevRel? Uh, so this, this aforementioned passion that I have about coffee um, it served me well when I would engage with our customers in the shop um, and begin to educate them on what a good cup of coffee should be um, and what they would likely enjoy based on what their you know, uh, preferences were. Um, and it wasn't uncommon for me uh, to convert someone who required uh, their coffee be equal parts milk, sugar, and uh, maybe a little bit of coffee to actually be able to drink coffee black because we understood what were the things that they, uh, what was their motivation, what did they like, and find something that worked. Um, and I always took that as a woohoo when I converted them. And uh, my wife actually, before we bought the shop, she used to have, uh, she would add coffee to her milk. Now she drinks coffee black because I walked her through that process. So. Uh, but it was all about finding what they were looking for, what they were wanting, um, and even for some people need, by asking the right questions, uh, listening to them and building those relationships. So, um, Douglas Adams, who wrote The Great Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he actually had this statement, um, and I think he says it best, around understanding your, your communities and develop relations is to give real service, you must add something which cannot be bought or measured with money, and that is sincerity and integrity. And to me, that's DevRel to a T. Um, you, you have a product that you're evangelizing or that you're spreading the good news about, uh, and it requires that you actively are listening, uh, that you are uh, asking questions, you're building relationships with those developers that are using that product, and it's not always about giving them pizza and beer, um, which, you know, that doesn't hurt, but it's not always about that. But it is about being intentional in your activities towards them, being authentic. Uh, developers can, they can see through marketing. Uh, it used to be, you know, back in the many years ago uh, that e when email was new, um, you'd be so excited to get an email that you would, you know, as soon as you heard the, you've got mail, boom, you opened it up, you read it, it was, it was novelty. That has long since gone. How many of you, when you hear the ding of mail, you get that inner, like, soul-sucking feeling of, oh, crap, I got an email. We didn't used to have that. It used to be like, this is the most joyous occasion in life. It's like when you get, would get a phone call back in the day. Like, that was the thing. It was so exciting. Developers now have been so marketed to that email doesn't work. Traditional marketing stuff, they see right through it. It's not, because traditional marketing is not relational. It's not personal. It's very much removed from that. Um, and so um, the important thing is, is you've got to build that trust with developers. Um, and the sincerity and integrity which is extremely important. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, so that's where this whole, whole kind of coffee and DevRel metaphor starts to really kind of take shape. <clears throat> so as mentioned earlier, coffee is supposed to have flavor. Um, and again, char is not a flavor. I'm going to say that multiple times because you got to get it through your head. If you like Charbucks, come talk to me afterwards. We'll put a hex over you and hopefully you'll not. But um, it, it's a mental condition, I've come, come to think, that if you think that char is a flavor, you might, we might have to do something. So, um, but um, again, coffee has flavor. I'm gonna keep saying that, because I wanna make sure. How many of you guys, nah, I won't ask that question. Um, so in order to make sure that you get all that stuff, that you've gotta have certain pieces go into building that cup of coffee, building the good DevRel program. And so um, we're going to kind of walk through this, and I have enough time for this, so we're going to do this. I'm going to brew a French press here while we're doing this, illustrating the different pieces of, um, of DevRel and of coffee. So, uh, and this is the first time trying this, so bear with me. We'll get there. Uh, so uh, without good equipment, you can't make a good cup of coffee. Um, it's extremely important uh, that, you know, 
you have good equipment. Doesn't mean you go and spend your college, your kid's college fund on coffee equipment. Um, I don't encourage that, even though it might be fun. Uh, I don't encourage doing it. But you can brew a good cup of coffee with an AeroPress, with a French press, even with just a regular, you know, in, the, in America, the drip coffee. Here it's more the, you know, making the Americanos. But it's, you can make it with cheap equipment as long as you have good equipment. Um, you can even, you know, a brew for less than $40, you could be set up with a decent brewing system and still have a good cup of coffee whenever you want. Um, the, uh, yeah, so the equipment. So here I have a French press. I have a portable grinder. Um, I have a scale and water kettle. It's all the different pieces you need. So I have the water, I have the equipment, I have the coffee. Here's the coffee. Um, yeah, so just as good equipment is essential for a, a good cup of coffee, uh, so are the tools that you uh, use for yourselves and for your team are just as important. Um, so things in for your developer audience. So things like SDKs, documentation, libraries, all of those things are essential pieces for a good developer relations program. Um, and you can't neglect them. You've got to have, they've got to be there. Developers, developers may not like reading documentation, much less writing it, uh, but they like to know that if they do have a problem, they can go read it. They can go find out. They can have something that helps get them down that path, whether it be that they go to a community and can ask a question and it's there, or they can go to the documentation and it's searchable and it actually has pieces in there. They want to know that it's there. Um, so, that in the, so having you and your tools available is extremely important for them. Um, so your libraries and SDKs also need to be something that's easy to use. Um, and it, a good rule of thumb is that if you have an SDK or you have a library or you have a uh, piece of content that walks somebody through how to implement your, you know, whatever it may be, in integrate your widget with, uh, you know, OpenStack, whatever it might be, that you want to make sure that that process is so simple that the least technical person in your company can run it. And if they can't, there's a problem. You need to fix that. You need to make sure that tool or that documentation or that walkthrough, whatever it is, that tutorial, is as simple as possible that somebody that's not technical can do it. So you could make the argument um, that water, that water is the most important ingredient for coffee. Um, I think you could probably make that because coffee has to be a liquid one in its finished form, so water is extremely important. Um, you can't have a cup of coffee without it. So you can use tap water, you can use bottled water, um, but it needs to be as clean as possible. Um, some tap water is better than others. Um, you might want to go and, you know, to get a good cup of coffee, you might have to go with bottled water. Um, but I do recommend using filtered water as, as all, all possible. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn that on. Um, coffee shops have to have filtering or else their equipment gets built up. So, you know, you have, you know, coffee shops are going to be using filtered water. If you can use filtered water, great. If not, regular water is good. Um, empathy. With the developer relations program, too often uh, that word empathy is missing from a lot of developer relations or a lot of communities that I've been a part of that I've seen. Um, a good definition for that. So Merriam-Webster, uh, the dictionary has, the English dictionary has this definition. Uh, it's the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another of either the past or present without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. That's a lot of words. Um, what it really comes down to, though, is 
that as a member of a DevRel team, you have to be able to, uh, to understand, be aware of, sense, hear what the developers are saying. Understand it. Um, I don't know that you can, and, and I'll say this, and I'm welcome to be proven wrong. I don't know that you can um, teach empathy as much as you can be more sensitive to empathy. Um, I used to say when I was uh, um, teaching, uh, uh, when I was teaching our baristas how to brew, I used to tell them that I could teach a, a, I could teach a monkey to pull espresso shots. I can't teach a monkey to give good customer service. And I think an empathy is one of those that it's got to come out of who you actually are. We can help give you some of the resources to be better at it, but it, it has to be part of who you are. Um, uh, you don't have to, you know, another way of saying is em empathy is, is advocacy. Developer advocates are, are, you know, have this or should have it. Um, your developer relations program should, you know, have these pieces. They don't have to be technical. Um, it helps to, you know, have some technical expertise, but a good developer relations professional doesn't have to be a full-time developer. They just need to be able to, to listen and communicate and hear what those developers are experiencing and get it to somebody that cares, or not cares, get it to somebody that can do something about it. Everybody should care. Um, so um, developers don't care what you know until they know that you care. One of my sayings, I, you'll probably hear me say it a lot. So with water, temperature, we just, uh, it just reached boiling point. Um, the, it's extremely important that cough, that in order for all of the science around it to happen, coffee's got to be at a certain temperature. The water's got to be at a certain temperature when it brews, which, and I did not do the conversion to Celsius, um, but in America, that would be between 199 to 205 Fahrenheit. Um, if somebody wants to figure out what that is in Celsius, it'd be great. I can hopefully remember it. But it's got to be hot. It's got to be just off boiling point is essentially what that is. Um, similar when you brew tea, it's got to be on that. Very rarely do you have, will there be a, a brewer at home, like a coffee brewer, that can actually reach that temperature. Um, the ones that can, you're spending a bunch of money on, uh, which is why I encourage doing a French press because you can boil the water and you at least know that it's starting out at a good spot. Okay, yeah, so yeah, I actually, in my notes, I did do it, 90 to 96. So yes, there you go, thanks, Carol. Um, but yeah, it is nifty science about why it is and all that, but it's gotta be hot. Um, so here it's just come off. I'm gonna put it just again since I've been talking. Um, community, I'd say the community is kind of your water. It's, it's what really kind of brings everything together. Um, and if you spend any time around me, you know how passionate I am about community. Um, and it's why I kind of made it a full-time career uh, quite a few years back, is that I'm just so passionate about it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, and we, that's a whole other line of talk that I don't really have the time for, but community is that piece. Um, how many here were community managers? Three, four people? You know how important community is to your um, to your product in order for your you know, company and what you're doing to have impact. Uh, the barista, person making your cup of coffee um, is extremely important. Who here wants to, while I'm doing this, wants to grind the coffee? You wanna do it? All right, just keep turning it until it stops grinding. Um, people on your team are extremely important. Um, it's, not, it's not gonna start with one training session. Uh, it's something that's going to continually happen, it's can continually grow. Uh, they, you need to invest in them. They need to be in uh, learning as much as they can. Um, barista literally means somebody that prepares coffee. Like that's, you know, what that word means. Um, oh, also, people at Starbucks are not baristas. They're just pushing a button. That's not barista. All right, I'm done. Um, so this, this is, the team is extremely important for your DevRel team. Uh, this was my offsite with my team uh, a month ago, two months ago. Um, 
Jim Collins uh, wrote in 2001, so it's, a, it's been a while, but he wrote a book uh, called Good to Great. And what he did is he analyzed companies that, you know, what was the difference between the good companies and the great companies? What made them the difference? And he said with the team members, it had everything to do with putting the right people in the right seats on the right bus going the right direction. Team is important. Um, and it's important you continue to invest in them. Like I said, help, help them connect with others. Uh, there are other, um, you know, help them build relationships. Uh, there's different things like Community Pulse, which is a great podcast. DevRel Radio is another good po podcast. Uh, DevRelCon is a great uh, conference to help, you know, to go and learn more about developer relations. Um, there's a DevRel Collective Slack group. Um, that's out there. There's Devro Weekly, which is a, uh, a good um, email newsletter that goes out. All of those are important uh, for, your for your people on your team in Devro. Beans, what you got here. Beans are extremely important for coffee. Uh, they need to be fresh. They need to be uh, brewed. Uh, sorry, they need to be ground in the uh, right way for what you're brewing. Uh, so here I've done a coarse grind because we're doing a French press. Uh, it has to do with how long the um, water gets brewed, sorry, how long the uh, water comes in contact with the beans. And so in this case, uh, somebody do a timer for, just start a timer and let me know four minutes. Rain, can you do that? Okay. Okay. So uh, the beans are extremely important. The weight of those are all important as well. Um, good quality beans. I mentioned. I recommend um, single origin. It means it comes from one farm, uh, and it's not from multiple. Uh, blends tend to be the leftover beans. They're less quality. Uh, they're not good. Decaf is of the devil. Just don't even go there. Um, beans are also kind of like your product. You want to have a fresh product for your company um, and how you're presenting it. If you're somebody that's going and uh, writing content or you're doing talks or you're doing stickers or you're doing any of those things, uh, the message you're trying to give has got to be something that's uh, fresh. Um, some, uh, some companies that do it really well, uh, you know, you see a good sticker game. Um, it's a ton of stickers. <laughs> uh, one of the companies uh, I know, uh, Algolia, they have a search product, and what they do very heavily is any of their conferences, they have uh, stickers that have been customized for that conference. And so they're keeping it fresh. There's these, there's those, there's these, there's some more, others, even buttons. They're all, they got tons of stuff, and it's all relevant to the product and to the people that are in that audience that they're, that they're working with. Um, so DevRel is an important piece for a company, um, and if none of these things, like if all these things aren't working together, it's going to be completely out of balance and everybody's going in all different directions and it just makes me sick looking at it actually. So uh, in conclusion, uh, in 2010, after two years of running a coffee shop um, and not sleeping much and also having our kids go, ah, you have to go to the coffee shop again, um, we finally sold the coffee shop. Um, it, uh, we built it up. We built up the business. We learned a lot from it. Um, it was successful, um, but we had reached a spot where we needed to make a change. Um, we don't regret it, but learned a lot, and it, especially when it comes to uh, learning how developer relations is extremely important for a company. Um, and, uh, you know, no regrets. Had to throw that in there. So we don't regret it. Um, sure, we don't have an espresso machine in our basement anymore that we could make coffee whenever we wanted. Um, but 
coffee and developer relations go together because it's all about the experience, it's about the product, it's about the people, and uh, thank you. Enjoy coffee. Um, who wants a cup of coffee? You have to ask a good question first. <laughs> so I got, we got a couple minutes for questions. Looks like we got three minutes, four, five questions. So who has a question? So the coffee shop that we had was in, is that what you're asking, is where, where was it? Uh, it was in Kansas, so smack dab in the middle of the US. Um, and it still is there today. It's still going, um, still going strong. And in fact, people that bought it from us sold it to somebody else that came in and had a ton of resources. And it's still going. And I still go there today um, and have people uh, still see people to this day that we're customers. So, cool. You get a cup. Uh, anyone else? Mm. Yes. So burnout is a thing. Um, there were many times, you have to take time for yourself. Uh, you have to be able to recognize it. And the biggest piece for that, um, we were, we were uh, lucky enough that we had people who uh, said, hey, you need to take some time. Uh, we'll take your kids. And it was even people in the coffee shop that were employees that said, hey, I'm going to work this shift. You go out and do something else. Um, you have to have people in your life that will call that out for you and say, okay, all of this that you're experiencing is because you're burnt out. You need to take a break. Um, I have a number of people that are in my uh, group of friends that we do that. You have to also have a life outside of DevRel, outside of coffee, that allows for that. And there's probably more that could be extrapolated on that, but that's a good start. Anything else? I got a couple more cups. All right, I'm going to pop over here. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.